Right, yeah, the last video worked, so it's looking good. Okay. So have you read the Anapanasati Sutra now? I have. Good. Um, I probably will get the book out in a moment, but... Uh, the first thing that I want to do is to talk with you about the overview of the Anapanasati Sutta. We can divide right. it into the, into the following parts. The introduction, the discussion of Anapanasati, the discussion of the Satipatthana, the discussion of the Sambhojana, and then the final discussion of the knowledge and deliverance. So you can see that there are five different sections of that sutta. The introduction to the sutta points out something that many, many students I don't think pick up on when they read the sutta about how important this sutta is. I don't know of any other sutta that starts with a declaration of the audience and how auspicious it is. But if you'll notice, many of the, in the very first page, within the first couple of paragraphs, many of the prominent monks in the time of the Buddha are named. Okay. Did you notice that? I did notice that, yeah. Yes, and not only that, but it showed which of them were teachers and approximately how many students each of those teachers brought with them to this particular meeting. Right. Okay, so that puts this particular sutta in a class by itself in that regard because most of the other suttas are discussions of laymen or people who are in parts of other religions who are coming to the Buddha with specific questions, many of them trying to trick him. Right. Uh, and um, they wind up, uh, in, on many occasions, converted either to become monks or to become lay followers of the Buddha. But okay. This particular sutta is a different kind of sutta it also uh, mentions other meditation techniques. Uh, as it turns out, the metta meditation as well as the kasina meditations predated the Buddha. And he talks about those that are practicing some of these other things. But that the Buddha wants to lay out here his, his practice and that many of the, uh, the teachers who teach about Anapanasati will talk about Anapanasati in the following way. They will say that while other meditation <clears throat> techniques have their advantages for various different people under various circumstances, that Anapanasati works in all cases for all people and is always available. As an yeah. example, if you are doing charnel ground meditation, you'll need a charnel ground. If you're doing uh, a casino meditation, you'll need some kind of casino. Uh, but if you're doing mindfulness of breathing, you can do it at any place at any time. Now, this is an important point that a lot of people miss uh, the, the significance of, they say, oh yeah, it's available all the time, and then they just drop it like that, rather than recognizing, no, it's not that the technique is available to you all the time because the breath is there, but rather that you should be doing it all the time because the breath is there. That's one of the subtleties that many students miss, especially yeah. when they have the concept of the idea that meditation is something that you do on a cushion rather than it's something that you do on a cushion to learn how to do it so you can do it all the time. Yeah. Okay, so that sets the stage and then the Buddha does the 16 stages of Anapanasati and stages or steps or other things like that is generally misleading because one people 
people think that a step means you take one step after another. So that if it's 16 steps from here to the toilet, I take one step and then step two and step 16. And when I get step 16, I reach the toilet. So in yeah, that so regard, these are not steps. It's to be practiced simultaneously altogether, right? Yeah. Okay. But in fact, if you want uh, a, a chronological sequence or, or steps, I can give that to you in other places, including one place in the sutta, as well as um, sutta number 24, which you should write down, because we should want to discuss that one also. It's right. called the chariot race. Where the chariot race has more to do, not a race, just the chariot relay. The chariot relay has more to do with progression of a student over time to where in the Anapanasati Sutta, the, four, the seven factors of enlightenment are chronological, but they're more chronological on a shorter time scale. Right. Uh, can you move your camera down, or can you move your camera down a little bit? Like yeah. That? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's right. a full view now. Yeah, I, I was only getting getting you about here. Okay, okay that's all right. Um, there's there's nothing beautiful here. <laughs> nothing to see, <laughs> folks. <laughs> um, so the Satipata, Satipatthana is the framework. Uh, the Satipatthana, the four foundations of uh, human existence, right. basically. You have a body, you have uh, knowledge of that body through the uh, electrochemical processes with neurons that we can call feelings. Those neurons are connected not only throughout all of the body and down to not every cell, but certainly within every cell that has to respond. Uh, like nerve cells and, and muscle cells and whatnot like that, are all connected then to a central nervous system that is normally considered mind, and then the mind's objects are the things that the mind is paying attention to. Uh, these being the four foundations, and by far, uh, the one that's the most important in the regard of how to practice is going to be step four or the uh, Dhammanupassana, the content of the mind. Uh, but how the contents of the mind operate uh, is very much wrapped up with the body and the feelings. It is a conglomerate and that in fact most people uh, let us say throughout history have not bothered to with, make an inspection within themselves to see these four aspects. Sorry, and can I just interrupt? Can I just interrupt you there just for one second? I noticed that the volume is very crackly. Are you using the same audio as last time? No, I wasn't. Now I am. Is All right. Better? No, it's not better. Uh, it's not, okay. Let me try one with the microphone right in front. Okay, how is this? Is this better? That's perfect now, yeah. That's good now, huh? Yeah. All right, okay. Um, so the Satipatthana is, is the way that the Buddha divides the body-mind complex up. Uh, most Christians, and in the West, we have the concept of a heart. Basically, what we mean by that is emotions, but the Christians want to put a very special emphasis on it. Uh, uh, and many people in the West do, too, in the sense that they think that... Uh, how they feel about things is more important 
or that's the most important thing of all is how they feel about things. And yeah. the surprise is, is that most people are the most out of control with their feelings. They're out of control with their mind also, but really uh, they're out of their control of feelings uh, in a way that affects them because of ignorance. We're out of control of our feelings because our society and uh, uh, the way that the uh, the advertising and the uh, large business community through a man named Bernays. Have you ever heard of uh, Bernays? No, I never heard. He it was a, I think, a nephew of Sigmund Freud and was very adept at what Sigmund Freud was teaching. And during World War II, uh, leading up to World War II, he became very powerful in the United States because he was able to help businessmen make a profit in a new way by using the techniques and, uh, and the stuff that uh, uh, he was getting from his uh, uncle, Sigmund Freud. Now, this is a significance beyond imagination. Most people think that Sigmund Freud was interested in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis in order to help individual um, patients or clients. To where, in fact, that was not the case at all. That Sigmund Freud was an armchair empiricist that was trying to learn about why people behaved in certain ways with no interest in a cure at all. Okay. Um, almost like an archaeologist is very interested in going into a ruined chapel without any expectation of restoring that chapel to its original condition at all. Right? So yeah. when Bernays comes by with his ways of doing things, um, he looks at it in the sense of not how to help people through psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, but how to use psychoanalysis and psychotherapy to control people, to manipulate them through their feelings. Right. Okay, so, so here's some of the examples of what he did. Uh, before or during these times, let's say 100 years ago, um, that it was extremely rude behavior for women to smoke cigarettes. That in fact, cigarettes had just been introduced that before that it was all cigars, but cigarettes were introduced. And I think that Bernays may have in fact had something to do with that. But during the women's suffrage movement, he put a whole group of debutantes in a parade, all of them smoking cigarettes with the um, uh, the advertisement of that the freedom and of women uh, and liberation of women through suffrage and smoking were related somehow. And he was actually able to get the women of the United States to take up the habit. And we're not talking about 1%. I think there was already about 1% when he started. And he moved it up to about 20, maybe 25% of the population smoking cigarettes, uh, women. And that that was a tremendous coup. He later worked with the automobile industry and was using, he was the one who introduced sex to sell automobiles. So back in the 1940s and 50s, you will always have a, um, uh, the new car on some sort of spinning around uh, a turnstile. And there's always a pretty girl there with her hand on the car. Okay, yeah. and so this is how automobiles were sold to Americans as a symbol not of just freedom, but of sexuality. Yeah, they use that now for everything, I think. Now they're doing it with everything, which means yeah. that now the mind of the American has a new kind of pollution that they didn't have 100 years ago, and that most of the people on the planet Earth do not have the kind of polluted mind that the Americans have. Yeah. Because nowhere else in the world was the advertising industry done quite the way that it was. Uh, even here in Thailand, automobiles that are from the United States when they're advertised on television do not use sexuality to advertise their automobiles. Not the way that they have 
and continue to do in the United States. Um, so basically what happens then at this feeling level is, is that people get the idea that my happiness can be purchased. My happiness can be bought. My happiness has to do then with the uh, the station in life that I have that allows me to purchase the things that will make me happy. Now, uh, some scientific investigations have come to prove that at a very, very low base level, money has uh, some value or importance. That, that people who are at a very, very low poverty level, their lifestyle is significantly uh, hampered by hunger, lack of medicine, lack of water, lack of housing, uh, and basically uh, uh, the, the, the four requisites. But if we have enough to have the, the four basic requisites of enough food and water, enough clothing, adequate housing, and uh, basic medicines, uh, nothing fancy from a pharmacy, but, uh, uh, you know, maybe aspirin and, and gauze bandages, that kind of stuff uh, for wrapping wounds. But just at a very basic level, if people don't have these things, they'll be miserable. However, after they reach this basic level, generally the more money they have, the less happy they're going to be. Yeah, I've, I've actually noticed that from experience, you know, uh, people in third world countries, they generally seem much more happy with the basics of life rather than people in the first world countries who, you know, they have a lot of extra cash and stuff like that. You know, uh, they're usually miserable. And I think this suicide rate in first world countries is much higher, extremely higher than, you know, in third world countries. So it's quite obvious. Yeah. Yes. And that you can take some examples. I don't know if I've told you uh, um, some of the examples of very, very rich or wealthy people, but gosh, the, the list is long. John Bellucci and uh, 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 oh, Elvis Presley. Uh, a good example is uh, Aristotle Onassis' daughter. Uh, she, uh, e even though her father set everything up in his shipping business to be run by trust and by uh, um, uh, trust funds and other things like this with administrators who he trusted. After he died, his daughter didn't trust anybody and she wound up destroying his fortune just because she didn't trust anybody. She was nuts about it. I mean, she became paranoid thinking that everybody was trying to rip her off. Well, okay. isn't that exactly the way that all very rich kids operate? You know, they think that there's that somebody is always after them, always yeah. after their money. Uh, and that um, uh, come to think of it, they might actually be better with, off without it. <laughs> um, They're like a dog on, a, on his bone. If you walk close to the bone, the dog will, you know, react and try to protect it. <laughs> can you repeat that for me please oh, I said it's like an analogy of you know the dog if a dog has a bone you know if you try to go close to the bone the dog will try to protect the bone it will overreact you know that's the way the the rich kids probably react yeah precisely precisely in fact the bigger the bone they have the more vicious they'll do uh, in protecting it where in fact uh, the bigger the bone should be easily shared <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, so yes, that's exactly correct. Uh, and that what we've wound up with in, in America is an economy of greed, a culture of greed that in back, back in the 1980s, there was a movie that came out that just about sealed it. It was like the, uh, uh, um, the lock after you, you close the box. And that was a, a book uh, or a movie, uh, let's see, what was the name of, Wall Street, I believe, was the name of the movie. And that there was a guy in it, uh, uh, the lead actor, uh, the name of the part was uh, Gecko. 
uh, and that uh, he's the one that, uh, even though he didn't say it as a direct quotation, it comes out of the movie of Greed is Good. And yeah. so the Americans have bought that now, that greed is good, and that our whole society is wrapped up in, uh, uh, the, I guess the, the, the joke would be, he who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, but people with a lot of money and people who are not satisfied with a lot of money wind up doing a tremendous amount of damage both to themselves, their family, and, and to society in general because they want more money. That never mind how much they have, it becomes almost a contest. Yeah, to, and then if, if they actually lose all their money, they can't handle it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's like the go ahead. It's like the end. It's like the end of the road for them. If if they actually become bankrupt, they wouldn't be able to handle it like an average person. That's precisely true, and that's exactly what happens with people who win lotteries. That lottery winning has become quite famous. In fact, most of the lotteries now want to dole money out over a twenty-year period because of the catastrophe that happens if they give all the money out at one time. Not to mention the fact that the lottery company makes money, uh, or the state, or whoever runs the lottery, because of the time value of money. If they're going to divide it up over a 20-year period, they only have to pay out five percent of what they uh, of what they have to pay out. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but people who get all of their money all at once, generally within three years, they're worse off than when they were before they they won the lottery. One of the first things they do is they start burning bridges, they quit their job, you know, and all kinds of stuff like this. But then what happens is is that everyone whoever knew them comes out of the woodwork for a handout. And so they want to protect their money and, and you know, their first cousins and their nephews and the kids they went to high school with and everybody just comes after yeah. them for a handout. And that makes everything very miserable. Everybody now is in a state of want. The guy who got the, uh, the won the lottery wants everybody to go away, and everybody else wants him to uh, give them money. So everybody is in a state of uh, great desire and want because of all of this wealth. It's like the dog again with a great big bone. The bigger the bone, the more he growls. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and this is... It's not typically an American disease, but it is a wealthy man's disease. And whoever has uh, a lot of wealth winds up generally catching this disease uh, where the money becomes more important, actually, than their entire life does. Okay. And that they're making all one basic mistake. Every one of us is making one basic mistake in this regard. That mistake is what the Buddha calls ignorance or delusion. We have the delusion that wealth or money or power or whatever like that is going to make us happy. But there's an underlying foundation below that. If people were already naturally happy, then they wouldn't be making the mistake that money will make them happy. Okay. So we have a basic foundation that we're starting with. The humanity is an unhappy group of people. <laughs> uh, most animals don't have to deal with this. This is something that's uh, uh, different from, from, from animals, though I watch the dogs here quite a bit uh, and see how devoted uh they are to each other and to me with with family connections and whatnot, uh, and how they they guard the house and whatnot. But they're generally very content. Yeah, the dogs are generally content. Um, to where with humans, uh, we're not content. There's another kind of concept that um, that Americans and people are worldwide are happening. Here in Asia, the mentality is, is that your financial security will be coming from your family. 
And so family connections are important. In the United States, the idea is, is that your security is going to be coming from some sort of job. And that has two aspects. One is, is that the job may be long, far away. And so jobs actually destroy families. And second, uh, because the job becomes more important, the family just becomes less and less important. Now, uh, the Americans have had several things throughout history that have destroyed families in a way that have not happened in other places throughout the world. Uh, but it has in Australia. Australia is another place where it's happened, but not as badly as it's happened in the United States. What we've had was, first off, when America was discovered, you had a whole bunch of people coming over to America from Europe. Most of them were men. Okay, okay, that meant that families were being disruptive just to start America. Not okay. only that, but there was a lot of warfare over here. There was a lot of killing going on, and that required um, uh, armies. And um, uh, many of the uh, uh, army people were um, what they call mercenaries, uh, uh, Hessians, um, uh, Eastern Europeans that were brought uh, into uh, into France just to militarize them so that they could be sent to the United States. So in the beginning of the United States, you, you had a tremendous problem with uh, um, more men than women coming over here, uh, a destruction of, uh, of um, the families. Another thing that tore families apart, basically it started in Europe, was the, uh, the Reformation, where the church was being torn apart. And while mostly this did divide along uh, class lines, there were some uh, problems within families. But when we got to the United States, when we had issues with the slavery and with uh, 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 what le led up to the Civil War, You've actually had brothers killing brothers. You had another complete annihilation of family structures during the Civil War. The same thing has now happened with, uh, with business in the sense that now the job is more important. So you can see how that family structures have fallen apart over time in the United States, living people leaving people with very little sense of security coming from family. Okay. Uh, most adults in the United States neither look after their parents nor uh, expect the old family land or the old family property to uh, be part of their inheritance. That uh, because of social uh, changes, we don't look to, for our parents or our families to take care of us anymore. We look to for a job to do it. Okay. Within the concept of the family, you also have the concept of family business. One of the major things that has happened over time, and is especially um, not exactly required by law, but it is. it seems to be because it's so predominant that whatever a, a man has as his profession, his son will take up that profession and probably even maintain that same business. So you have uh, within Asia, uh, as well as to a small degree in the United States, you'll have a, a class of people that you will call entrepreneurs. But an entrepreneurial spirit or an entrepreneurial idea requires some sort of basis or foundation. You'll have to have a, uh, a loan or whatever to go into business. But here in Asia, people can go into business with far fewer resources because they have the family to back them up. And so uh, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Cambodia, uh, Burma, uh, this area of Southeast Asia is, a, is an entire area of entrepreneurs. Everyone is willing to start a business. Most of the people in Thailand are not employed by an employer. They're employed okay. with their family. 
okay? And Walmart has not been able to shut down what they call mom and pop shores. Well, in Thailand, it's not mom and pop alone. It's the whole family that's running that store. But in uh, in that regard, uh, yes, there is Tesco. There is Macro. There is Big C. They do big business here in Thailand, but they have not by any stretch of the imagination harmed the small entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, basically through these uh, family connections. So um, what I'm getting down to then is the value and the importance of employment. Because if you have a job, if you are employed, you are either going to be um, subject to the whims of the boss or subject to the whims of the boss as controlled by a government. Here in Thailand, people don't think jobs are very important. If, you, if they have a, a, a spat with a boss, or if there is uh, uh, the boss says, I want you to work this weekend, and the guy says, no, I've got to go home because I've got family business, and the boss says, I really need you, the kid will walk out. Jobs are not yeah. important. Families are important here in Thailand. Okay. Um, they also, um, the way that things are structured, generally, uh, most family groups have one apartment that they will keep in Bangkok, and then everybody in the family during various times of the year will come down and stay in that, um, uh, that apartment. Uh, and then they'll go back and forth to their ancestral home. And that uh, what this, this this has basically to do with the farming or the agrarian idea that you plant rice and then you go to Bangkok and play for a month or two and then you come back and you do the harvest or whatever like that. So that uh, people in Thailand have, they have time and it's part of the culture that people do have time. Within the United States, look how harried people get because they think that their job is so important. They wind up that the job becomes more important than family, it becomes more important than life, and that it's because of the money that's wrapped up with it, that the money that the job gives you and the job itself wind up being the most important qualities of a human's life in the United States. And that's a tragedy. tragedy. But that's yeah. how most people live. And not only do they live like that, but they don't even have the concept that there's better ways of living. They think that that's the way that it has to be done. That's part of their society. Uh, the, the bottom line at this point is that People are really ignorant about what's really important or what's really valuable. Uh, and that it's all based on the ignorance of feelings. That if people could be happy without the job, then very few people would be employed. Yeah. And if happiness were the most important thing, then people would be, I mean, it actually is the most important thing when you pin people down to it, but they don't spend their lives as if it would be an important thing. They spend their lives as if money and the job were the most important thing because uh, uh, big business wants you to think so. Big business wants you to think that you need that job uh, and yet they still don't want to pay anything for it. So you'll find people in the United States that wind up with four or five jobs because yeah. they can't make ends meet. But if they would start looking at the ends that they're trying to meet and would cut down and go back to a very, very basic lifestyle, they may not need all of that, all of those jobs. So they would begin to have some of the time that they would need to actually straighten out some of their real problems. Um, this is what the Buddha, he, he knew about this in a way, but it's a, it's a much bigger problem now than it was yeah. in the time of the Buddha. 
Uh, and because of that, because of the cultural differences, um, it's hard for, for modern Western man to see how these really, really old techniques um, have real value to them because these really, really old techniques, one thing, were de developed for a, a society that was so different than our society is today. And okay. yet, what will happen is, is that if people get involved with the teachings of the Buddha and start practicing that, that means that their lifestyle chart starts to change quite a lot, that their uh, priorities about what's important begins to change. Uh, and that uh, you, can, you can say that that change comes because of wisdom. They begin to wake up. They begin to see that uh, uh, the way that we've been living our lives is not that valuable, uh, that there are better ways of living, and that the most important quality of that at this particular level that we're talking about is the quality of, of the knowledge that you, in fact, can control your feelings, that you can begin to manage them. But if you look at the way that our uh, uh, American system, our government, our business systems and our schools and even our religions are designed to teach us to be out of control of our feelings so that we need big business, big government and big religion and rely upon them to find our happiness. Because okay. they're the ones who uh, uh, handle the gold. They're the ones who make the rules. Yeah. So uh, this, this whole concept that by working with the Satipatthana through the body-mind that we in fact can learn to control our feelings will liberate you. This is one of the liberations. Okay. Uh, that the, uh, uh, the Buddha talks about it in the fact that uh, uh, we talked about it no, wait a minute. That was with Paul, with uh, not Paul. It was another student. We talked about it. Uh, write this one down also. Uh, MN nine. Uh, excuse me. MN eleven, verse nine. MN eleven, verse nine is probably uh, the most succinct way of looking at everything that the Buddha has to teach. And basically, what he's saying there is that while other religions understand that suffering uh, uh, is caused by clinging to sensual desire. In other words, Christianity, boy, do they hate sexuality. And Muslims, they're really over the top with it. And uh, kind of, they, they preach an anti-materialism that winds up being materialistic. And anti-materialistic materialism is, in fact, what, what they wind up with. But the Buddha says that there's actually four modes of clinging, not just this one. Uh, that uh, and and then you could put materiality. For instance, Paul made the the statement that the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, but within the the context of the Buddha, he puts sensuality and materialism in the same group. But then he says there's three other groups that most religions never think about. And that's attachments to beliefs. In fact, almost all religions will load you down with beliefs. They'll give you so many beliefs <laughs> that you'll have to wind up putting them into a system called a belief system to where the Buddha says, come out of beliefs. Don't believe anything. Don't believe it because somebody's told you. Don't believe it because it looks good. Don't believe it because uh, you found it in an old book. Don't believe it because it's normally wide practice. Don't believe it because a teacher told you. This, by the way, I'm quoting out of the Kalama Sutta. You can write this one down. A-N-1.65. the Kalama Sutta, where the Buddha talks about it, but he's talking here to a group of lay people, the Kalama people, to where in the Brahmajala Sutta, which is DN number one, he talks about the net of views. 
in the sense that all views are to be abandoned. Yeah. Because they're wrong views. And as I think I mentioned to you before, when I was looking in one of the suttas, uh, uh, the Great Forty, where right view is deeply discussed, that they never give a right view. Where right view is deeply discussed, what he talks about is wisdom factor, investigation. This is what one is one's right view to not come to a conclusion, but to always leave it open to further investigation. Right. So that views clinging to views. Now, in the earlier part of the sutta, a couple of verses before that, and uh, the uh, by the way, number eleven is called the Chula Singhanada, the the uh, small the short lion's roar. The Buddha talks about being and not being. Some people cling to being and others cling to not being. And in the regard of the word being, we're talking about generally things in whatever. And so you can think of the being of a God and the being of not a God. If you hold the view that there is a being of God, or if you hold the view that the, the, of the being that there's not a God, then you are subject to conflict. You are subject to conflict not only with others who hold different views, but you'll also be subject to conflict of, of agreeing, uh, of disagreeing about the details of the views. At some place in there, if you're dividing things between being and non-being, then uh, you're holding a view. Okay. And the... Uh, what about... What about the, the view of the law of karma? Of what? The view of the law of karma. I, I don't say the word again. The view no, of what? Karma. Uh, karma. Karma? Yeah. Oh, wow. We're going to have to get into that one. Yes, people hold views about karma. Uh, Kama, in fact, the Buddha uh, talks about as an imponderable. He also admits, this was not part, this is a long discussion. Let me see if I can give it to you in a very quick brief. The original concept of Kama is, is that there is good action that leads to good results and there is bad action that leads to bad results. This is what they call the law of Kama. All right. All right. Okay. Well, bright results lead to bright action and dark results or dark action leads to dark results. This is the law of karma. The Buddha says there are some actions that are good that will lead to good results. Cause and effect but, relationship shows that. Okay. But is that not, a, is, is it not still a belief system? No. Well, it certainly does. If you believe that all action always leads to a result, that's a belief. If you believe that sometimes, on some occasions, that sometimes a good action will give good results, we can prove that. We can okay. also prove sometimes that bad actions lead to bad results. We can prove that sometimes. But when you get the idea that all action leads to some kind of result, then we're talking about a law, just like gravity. Gravity is in effect all the time. It's a law. Right. Even in deep outer space, the Andromeda galaxy is heading towards the uh, Milky Way galaxy full blast because they're attracted to each other gravitationally. Right. And that uh, is 2.5 billion no, 2.5, yeah, 2.5 million light years. If it, if, uh, uh, if it were billion, it would be too uh, uh, high a uh, percentage of the size of the universe. But 2.5 billion versus uh, uh, 14 billion, that's, uh, uh, that shows 
that there is significant distance between the uh, Milky Way and the uh, Andromeda Galaxy. And in fact, Andromeda Galaxy was not even discovered to be a galaxy without very good telescopes. It's, it's that far out, it's that much of a pinpoint. And yet with mathematics and other observations and whatnot, we can see that uh, Andromeda and the Milky Way are barreling towards each other at very high speed. Okay. Because of gravity. It's always there. You cannot drop a cup off your table without expecting it to fall. There's another kind of uh, law that uh, comes from mathematics, okay? The, uh, um, the associative law of addition. A plus B is equal to B plus A in all cases. There's not one time when the law of associative association of a mathemat or arithmetic does not hold. Always A plus B is equal to B plus A. Also, the associative law of multiplication, that A times B plus C is equal to AB plus AC. That's true in all cases, never. Okay, that leads us to then Pythagoras theorem. It leads us to many, many other pieces of information through mathematics that wind up being provable. But the right. basic two points of mathematics that are absolute proven beyond any any uh, imagination of a doubt would be that A plus B is equal to B plus A. Okay, the associative law of addition is in there all the time. The law of of uh, gravity is there all the time. Belief right. that comma is in effect all the time is a belief system that has no value to it. Here's okay. a here's a very very first off clear example coming right from the Buddha, and that is this: there are some actions that are mixed. Mixed actions will give then mixed results. Well, if mixed actions give mixed results, in other words, the Buddha talks about it precisely in the terms of dark, uh, a, an action that is both bright and dark will lead to results that are both bright and dark. Right. Now, that makes sense on an, uh, on an example level, but if you start thinking about it, this is what gives rise to the concept of unintended consequences. This gives rise to what the U.S. military calls collateral damage. They think they're going in and bombing and getting the right guys, but they'll get some bad guys, and they'll get some other people too. Their actions are mixed, not only on a, on a grand uh, uh, good versus bad behavioral, but just on intended outcome. Whatever right. people want, you know that your whole life, that most of the actions that you've taken have not given you the outcome that you were looking for. And that if it did, it had other unintended consequences also. This is how most behavior works. The word behavior in this regard is the same as the word comma or action. Okay. Well, if there is such a thing as mixed actions that give mixed results, that destroys the law of comma of good action gives good results and bad action gives bad results because you can't tell often when an action is good and when it's bad. And what kind of comma machine is there that makes that determination and then stores that information and associates it with the people? An example, you got a 10-year-old boy standing next to his father, and his father gets shot in the back by a man, and the boy sees the man, and he knows who he is. Ten years later, that boy shoots that man who shot his father. Now, I ask you, where is the law of comma in this? Did the law of comma kill that man because he killed the boy's father, or did the boy kill the man? Uh, the boy. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, the comma machine didn't do it. The boy did. 
And not only that, but the boy didn't do it through a law of karma. He did it through a law of cause and effect. He remembered. He thought about it. He went shopping for a gun. And all of that stuff was kept going in his head, in his mind. Okay? That was all inside the boy's mind. It wasn't inside some comma machine someplace. Right. So now I ask you, if that boy didn't shoot that man because the man killed the boy's father, then who will shoot the boy, uh, shoot the man? The boy doesn't do it. Who does it? Will the comma machine find somebody else to do it? It's, uh, that can't be known. That cannot be known. That's precisely <laughs> what the Buddha is getting at. You can't make those kind of determinations. Yeah. Okay, so comma is an imponderable. It's not a law. And yet, right. and yet for some reason, because the Hindus have comma as a law, and that the Buddha had to deal with people who believed in this law, that now in the West, somehow or another, we have the idea that Buddha and the law of karma are wrapped up together, to where in fact, no, they're, uh, if, if anything, they're, uh, <laughs> they're wrestling partners, or they're at war with each other. They are not partners in the sense of the karma by the Buddha. The Buddha taught against the law of karma. Yeah. But I've only given you three of them so far. There's actually a fourth law of karma that the Buddha teaches. By the way, this is all in number 57, the dog duty aesthetic. You can read this for yourself. The Buddha says that there are, in fact, four kinds of karma. The fourth one being the action that is not bright and not dark will lead to results that are neither bright nor dark. Okay. And this also leads to the end of action. Now, we can think of this from the position of the Arahat, like that once you become fully enlightened, that the law of karma is no longer in effect. Somehow the karma machine turns itself off or uh, at least puts a note in your database file saying, well, he's an Arahat, so karma doesn't work with him anymore. That's not the way that it works. Rather, it's an un understanding. And that is, uh, look at it directly like this, that if we know that bad results are associated with bad action, that we can, by not doing harm anymore, then our actions won't have harmful results anymore. In other words, once our, our sila becomes perfect, then we do no longer engage in bad behavior leading to bad actions. Furthermore, because we have come to the place of understanding, for instance, this concept of feelings, that my happiness is based upon my ability to manage my own feelings and my own mind rather than going to the outside world to find uh, solutions to my bad feelings. This is also true in the sense that... Um, I'll, I'll introduce the concept of dana. The word dana is a Pali word coming from the, the language of the Buddha that gives us directly the word donation. Surprise, surprise, but it is an in, in Indo-European language system. A lot of the English language is actually in the Pali. Now, right. Thai language is actually proto-Chinese. The linguistics call it a proto-Chinese language. And yet, much of the Chinese, uh, Thai language has Pali in it because of the history of uh, Buddhism coming to Thailand. So in some cases, the word even in Thai language and in English is the same word. <laughs> it's really amazing. Uh, because otherwise, they're not even in the same family group. Uh, so the word donation, we have a lot of them, and we'll talk about some of those words. But donation and dana, giving. The Buddha talks about dana or giving as a way of generating joy only when both the giver and the receiver 
are mutually happy about the transaction, then that then the dana is is worthwhile uh, 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 being given. Uh, but if you give somebody a gift and they don't want the gift, then nobody gets any joy out of that. My uh, uh, an easy example is Grandma gives little Johnny socks for Christmas. And then mom has to tell Johnny, tell grandma, thank you for the socks. And he, and he gives her a begrudging thank you. Now, who made out any of that? Nobody. That gift was completely useless. Yeah. Because the grandmother was not thinking about what Johnny wanted. She was not trying to help him out at all at that Christmas time. She was only going through the ritual of giving him a gift because it's expected for grandma to give him a gift. And there was no joy in Mudville over that gift at all. Well, guess what? Most gifts are like that. That we need to learn to give gifts that are well received. And that the Buddha also talks about that the gift, actually, I don't, know of any reference to where this is true, but I did learn that what so and milk and I have faith that some place that the Buddha said this is that um generosity is for the building of joy. Right. And if generosity doesn't build joy, then there's no reason to do it. But that the whole quality of uh, gift giving or Donna has to do with the quality of, of comma in the, in the regard that we do good things in order to get good results. Thai people give, put, they, they put, uh, they call it saibat in Lao, they call it takbat, which means putting something into the bowl for the monk. The people are taught at a very rudimentary level that this is a good thing to do to feed the monks, that it will give you results at a later time. The law of comma, in fact, will take care of this donation for you. All right. Okay. Christians have a similar idea. You give to the church and the God's going to give you something in return for it. Okay. Always a business deal. Okay. Yeah. Our good behavior has the quality of giving a good result is a fallacy because most of the time we give gifts, they don't get their intended uh, results. That we have to be very careful about giving gifts because most often people are not going to be happy about the gift that, that, that you gave them. But um, would it not be the, in, the, the intent, would it not be the intention of the generosity which will give you good karma rather than the, um, it's better to give in generosity rather than to give thinking that you're going to get something in return. Right? Exactly. Now we're looking yeah. for it. Okay. So Donna or gift giving should have an immediate result. You give the gift, everybody's happy right then. The law of karma has the quality that gift giving means that the benefit is going to be delayed sometime lifetimes away. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when we come out of the belief in the law of comma to operate like this, then our behaviors are no longer uh, behaviors that are designed to gain results far into the future. That we right. become momentary. We begin to live more in the here now. So if somebody is living in the present moment, they live a life of be here now or ta ta ta, then that means that the fourth aspect of karma is in full force because we are behaving now for the experience of now, not hoping that the karma machine is going to build up some sort of good behavior for us in the future. Right. All right. So much for that kind of belief. Now we know that uh, that comma is not to be believed in, not right. in the law, not as part of a belief system. Uh, I'll just I'll, 
go ahead. I'll have to go. I'll have to head off in about ten minutes because oh. I have to collect my I have to collect my daughter from school. Okay, but, um, we haven't even begun our Anapanasati Sutta discussion, but that's all right. We could do it at another time. Yeah, this well, might... I'd be I'd be back in like uh, let's see, I'd be back in about like thirty minutes. Oh, okay. For I'll be back in thirty minutes. For thirty minutes. And then I'll have to go again to collect my son. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you go get them both and then call me after that? Yeah, that will be at, uh, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that would be at 10 p.m. Your time or mine? Your time. That's okay. That's a couple sure. hours. No problem. Um, all right. So uh, before you go, let's cover these, these things then. That the Buddha's Arunapanasati Sutta is an extremely important sutta. Okay. And then he talks about that Arunapanasati practice is for the fulfillment of the of the uh, uh, Sambhujana. I mean, excuse me, the uh, uh, the four foundations of mindfulness. So it goes Arunapanasati, Satipatthana, Sambhujana. We practice the Satipatthana for the fulfillment of the Sambhujana, the seven factors of enlightenment. And we practice the seven factors of enlightenment for the fulfillment of knowledge and deliverance. Okay. This knowledge and deliverance that we're talking about in the Anapanasati Sutta is what brings the Eightfold Noble Path to a Tenfold Noble Path. All right. It eventually becomes tenfold when we add the knowledge and deliverance to it. That's why it's called the great 40 is because eight is not multiplied by four, but 10 is multiplied by four. That's right. why it's the great 40, number 117. Okay, so we'll leave it with that. You have okay. Anapanasati is a major, major teaching of the Buddha. Number two, Anapanasati is for the fulfillment of the Satipatthana. The Satipatthana is for the fulfillment of the Sambhujana, Sambhujana, seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment are practiced for the fulfillment of knowledge and deliverance. That's the structure of this sutta, and that sequence is put in there in the first of it, and then at, with each stage along the way. But in the beginning, he says all four of those. And then, in the, and then when he goes into Satipatthana, he says the Satipatthana is for the fulfillment of the Sambhujana. And then he says the Sambhujana is then for the fulfillment of the uh, knowledge and deliverance. So this right. is the sequence of this thing. And that the, uh, uh, but the sequence, again, is not temporal. It's not that you do Anapanasati for a year and then a year later that the Sambhujana, uh, the uh, Satipatthana is fulfilled. And then a year after Satipatthana, then the uh, Sambhujana, no, uh-uh. It starts at when you are practicing Anapanasati, you are practicing Satipatthana. When you are practicing Satipatthana, you are also at that time practicing the Sambhujana. Right? Yeah, We're doing I understand it for that. the fulfillment of it. Okay? It's like, yes. it's like when a child learns A, B, C's, that's for the fulfillment of learning to read. Well, guess what? A, B, C is a way of reading. It's already reading. Yeah. Okay. Learning the numbers, a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is for uh, uh, the fulfillment of learning arithmetic. But learning the numbers is also learning arithmetic. It's not just for the fulfillment of it, right? So it's right. A, it's a part of it. That's the way that we want to look at it. Okay. So go get your kids, and I'll see you later. Okay. I'll see you later. Thanks. Bye bye.